Hello and welcome back to this video series about the nice topic of complex analysis. And as you can see, we've reached part 33 and today we continue talking about residues. However, before we do that, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady via PayPal or by other means. Moreover, in the description you find a link to a PDF version and the quiz for this video. Okay, with this let's start the video with the topic residues for polls. Or more generally speaking, today we will talk about calculation rules for residues. However, first recall what we have learned in the last video when we have defined the residue for a holomorphic function f at an isolated singularity z0. The only thing we need there is a closed contour integral along a circle around the singularity. And there epsilon should be small enough, which means that inside this closed disk z0 is the only isolated singularity there. Ok, to start the video maybe let's immediately look at an example here. It can be a very general example, so let's take a function f defined on the whole complex plane. Moreover, it should be a holomorphic function and you know often such a function is called an entire function. And now what I want to do is that we artificially remove one point from the domain. In other words, we just create an isolated singularity. And maybe we just call this new function f tilde. Of course, f tilde should be the same as f, but now it's not defined at z0. This means now for this function we have an isolated singularity and we can talk about the residue. So the question here is, what is the residue of f tilde at z0? Ok, this is not hard at all, because you know we can calculate this contour integral here. The integral does not care if we put in f or f tilde, because it's simply the same. However, for the function f we have Cauchy's theorem, which essentially tells us that every closed contour integral gives us the value 0. Therefore also here we get out 0 for the residue. So in other words, if we don't have an isolated singularity at z0, the residue simply vanishes. So you can see this as a definition, we can extend the notion of a residue also for points inside the domain D. Indeed, later this definition will make some formulas simpler. Moreover, this property that the residue vanishes we can make even more general. Roughly speaking, you can remember, if the values of the function don't explode around the isolated singularity, the residue has to be zero. So let's formulate this in a precise way. So as always we need a holomorphic function f and an isolated singularity z0. And then what we do is that we look at the function only in the small disk around z0. So we can write this as f restricted to this dotted disk. And now if this new function, this restriction is bounded, then the residue at z0 vanishes. So you should immediately see this generalizes the example from above. And in fact the proof here is not much harder. So you know in order to calculate the residue the only thing we have to do is to look at this closed contour integral. And now we want an estimate for that, therefore we look at the absolute value of it. And now you should know, there we have our standard estimate where the length of the curve goes in. So if we call the curve gamma, we have the maximum of the function f along the curve times the length of the curve gamma. Ok, and now we know two things. First, we know this maximum is bounded because the whole function is bounded. So maybe let's call the bound simply capital C. And on the other hand, the length of our circle is simply 2 pi epsilon. And indeed, this is the crucial part, because we already know epsilon is not fixed. We can make it as small as we want. In other words, we can make the whole right hand side as small as we want. Therefore, the only possibility for the contour integral on the left hand side is that it was zero all along. And in conclusion, also the residue has to be zero. Ok, so I would say this fact is something you should remember 
without an explosion around the singularity, the residue will vanish. And now maybe the question is, in which cases do we have an explosion there? In fact, the first step there leads us immediately to the discussion of poles. Now, maybe you remember that in part 16, we have already discussed what a pole is. In short, an isolated singularity can be a pole for the function f. Okay, and maybe here it's a good thing to give an explicit definition for this term. So having a pole at z0 simply means that we can define a holomorphic function h on the epsilon disk. And indeed, this epsilon ball is the same as before. And now the function h should be simply defined as the reciprocal of the function f. So simply the inverse value of f. And moreover, at z0 we want to extend the function with 0. Okay, now we have two claims here. First, it should be possible to choose epsilon so small that this gives us a well-defined function. And second, the function that comes out is also holomorphic. So in other words, it means a pole is simply the inverse of a zero. Okay, so this is how we can define poles and now let's look at an easy example. So as always, we want to start with the function 1 divided by z minus z0. So here we suppose that z0 is a pole, which means we should be able to define the function h. So let's see if we can do that. And of course, it's not hard at all, we just look at the reciprocal of f of z, which is simply z minus z0. And obviously, we immediately see this is a holomorphic function. And therefore we can say for f z0 is a pole. Now you might already know it's possible to characterize poles in different ways. It's possible for holomorphic functions because we know holomorphic functions can be expanded into power series. So for example this function h here can be written as a power series with expansion point z0. And with that you can describe the order of the zero at the point z0. And exactly this can then be translated to the order of the pole for f. I don't want to write down all the technical details, but let's write it down as a fact. So having a pole at z0, so by the definition above, is equivalent to, to the statement that there is a unique natural number capital N, and a non-vanishing holomorphic function we can call g, which is also defined on a small epsilon disk around z0, such that f of z can be written in the following form. Namely, we have the factor z minus z0 to the power minus capital N, and then times the function g of z. So what you should see here is, it's possible to isolate the pole in such a factor. And you already know, this capital N is now what we call the order of the pole. Moreover, now we can also rewrite this statement when we use the power expansion of the function g. Because then we can conclude that we can rewrite f as a Laurent series. So we just have to multiply this factor with the power series expansion of g. Which means the most important part is that we get a non-vanishing coefficient a minus n. This can't be zero because the function g was non-vanishing before. It simply means that this capital N here is already chosen maximally. Therefore it makes sense to say that the order of the pole is capital N. Okay, and now you already know the coefficient a minus one corresponding to the power one here is the residue. Okay, and then the rest of the term here you know is a normal power series, so maybe let's write it again as a holomorphic function. And now maybe let's call it g tilde. Therefore also here let's include that we also find such a holomorphic function g tilde defined on the open epsilon disk. Okay, so in summary you see all the equivalences here follow immediately from our nice power expansion or Taylor expansion all holomorphic functions have. So you see this is very nice because now we are able to characterize the order of a given pole. 
And now with this knowledge and with this formula at the bottom here, we are able to calculate residues. So let's formulate this as the important theorem for the video. So the general assumptions are always the same. We assume that f is holomorphic and that 0 is an isolated singularity. But now, in addition, we also assume that Z0 is a pole of order n. Then, you know, we have this representation, which means we can get rid of all the quotients if we multiply with this highest factor here. In other words, Z minus Z0 to the power n times f of Z is a nice holomorphic function defined on our epsilon disk. In particular, it means that we can differentiate the function as many times as we want. So for example, we can do it n minus 1 times. And to denote this, let's use this notation here. So we look at the n minus 1 derivative of this function here. And then we want to evaluate this at the point z0. And this evaluation we can write as a limit z to z0. Okay, now if you look at this formula now, you should see everything will vanish except this term where we have a minus 1. Because only there we differentiate exactly how many times we need it there, such that this term z minus z0 vanishes completely. Therefore, our constant a minus 1 will remain, while all the other parts in the sum will be sent to 0. However, here please don't forget, if we form derivatives, we also get the exponents n and so on in front. Hence, in order to get a minus 1 back, we have to divide by these factors. Which is simply n minus 1 factorial. So you see, now we have proven that this calculation indeed gives us our constant a minus 1. And you already know, this is exactly our residue of f at the isolated singularity z0. So you see, now we finally have a nice calculation rule for the residue. And I would say, let's immediately apply it and check it for an example. However, please don't forget here, in order to apply this rule, you need to know the order of the pole. Therefore, if I write down the function f of z, you need to know what are the poles and which is the order. So for example here, for the function 1 divided by z squared times 1 plus z, we find two isolated singularities. So one at 0 and one at minus 1. And now we can easily check that z0 is a pole of order 2. Simply use one of the characterizations from above. This means now we can use this nice formula here where capital N is equal to 2. And indeed this makes the formula a little bit simpler. So for example, the factor in front is simply 1. And more importantly, we just have to differentiate once. This is not hard at all, because the function that remains here is very simple. Namely, you immediately see z squared will cancel here. So we just differentiate the function 1 divided by 1 plus z. Indeed, this is a simple calculation you should already know from calculus. Namely, it's minus 1 divided by 1 plus z squared. And now in the last step, we simply send z to 0. And then you see what we get is minus 1. So that's the result now. The residue of the function f at the isolated singularity 0 is given by minus 1. And now this means whenever you have a contour integral where this function is involved, you can use this fact for the residue. And this is what we know as the residue theorem, which we will discuss in the next video. Therefore, I would say, let's meet again, and I hope that I see you there. Have a nice day, and bye!